was to bring to bear the principle of common sense and rational discussion to the issues of our day. America was created at a time of great turmoil, tremendous disagreements, anger, hatred. There was a book written in 1776 that guided much of the discipline of thinking and brought to us the discovery of our freedoms, our God-given freedoms. Thomas Paine's Common Sense, written in 1776, one of the first American bestsellers, in which Thomas Paine explained by rational principles the reason why these small colonies felt the necessity to separate from the gigantic kingdom of England and the king of England. He explained their inherent desire for liberty, freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and he explained it in ways that were understandable to the people, to all the people, not just to the educated upper class, because the desire for freedom is classless, the desire for freedom adheres in the human mind and in the human soul. Today we face another time of turmoil, of anger, a very, very serious partisan division. This is exactly the time we should consult our history. Look at what we've done best in the past and see if we can't use some of that to help us now. We understand that they created the greatest country in the history of the world, the greatest democracy, a country that has taken more people out of poverty than any other country on earth. They weren't perfect men and women, and neither were we. But a great deal of the reason for America's constant ability to self improve is because we're able to reason, we're able to talk. Hello, this is Rudy Giuliani with Common Sense. We're here today with a very special episode that is going to deal with a crisis that seems to be overtaking the United States and the world very, very quickly. And we have with us three distinguished doctors who deal with it day in and day out. And I thought it would be really valuable for us to be able to talk to people who actually have experience with this as opposed to our political leaders who obviously have to deal with it, even our medical leaders who deal with it but at 180 degrees, 360 degrees, people right on the ground. I remember when I dealt with West Nile virus and with anthrax, getting the opinions of the people who have to deal with it day in and day out was critical to see what was going on. So we have three very, very distinguished doctors with us, and... um, we, we want to make sure that we cover as much as, as possible uh, to at least give you a sense of where we are right now. The first is Peter uh, Polisi from, from uh, Mount Sinai, from the Icon School of Medicine, and then from Monte Fiore Hospital. There's Dr. Mario uh, Garcia and Dr. Adam Keene, and they'll be on in succession. So we're first with uh, Peter Polisi, who is... Uh, with the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. He's a professor and chairman of microbiology. He's a Horace W. Goldsmith professor of medicine. He said he didn't know what Goldsmith was for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's a member of the National Academy of uh, Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine and the German and Austrian Academy of Sciences. And, but he's been in the United States for 50 years. So this is, a, this is an American with a very substantial European background, which helps a lot. And his work is in the area of, and you tell us, Peter, what you're working in viruses. And thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you very much for taking the time out, a very busy (laughs) time to educate people. It it is a very interesting situation. We are talking about COVID-19, and it stands for Coronavirus-Induced Disease 2019. So it's a coronavirus which is like many other viruses we know of, like influenza viruses, like measles. So it's a round uh, spherical wall, really, and inside is a genetic information which can replicate quite a lot in terms of, uh, uh, in eight hours, 100,000 new virus particles can form when the virus infects a cell. It has all those things on the side that 
got the name spikes. Corona. Co now, what do those spikes actually do? They allow the virus to attach to the cells and get into the cells and replicate. Like does that crazy. make it more? Uh, that, that, does that make it faster? The yes, it that, needs. The fact that it, there is a there is a receptor on the cell, and the virus recognizes that and can get in. So, like it's, an injection. It's almost an. It is like an injection. It's very effective, and uh, this virus uh, came uh, originated in China. There is no doubt about it. Uh, it orig originated somewhere uh, in the fall of 2019, uh, last year, and it has rapidly. Uh, gone from China, unfortunately, to other countries in Asia as well as to Europe and to the United States. As a cor coronavirus, what other viruses that we've experienced is it related to? So it is uh, what we call in the trade an RNA virus. It contains ribonucleic acid in as genetic information and therefore is similar to, for example, influenza, and also the symptoms are somewhat similar to influenza when we get infected by the coronaviruses. And it's similar also to MIR and SARS, isn't it? Correct. Uh, it is actually closer uh, related to these viruses, which are referred to as uh, SARS and uh, MERS viruses. They are all coronaviruses. And the only difference is we had uh, some outbreaks uh, 12 years ago, 10 years ago of uh, SARS and uh, MERS virus collectively, uh, 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 respectively, but uh, they have uh, died out very fast. This is not the case with COVID-19, with well, the latest one. The numbers here are dramatically higher they are at a very early, early stage than SARS and uh, MERS, although the fatality is not as great. Yeah, it depends what numbers you use. It is really a virus which has spread tremendously fast, and also the numbers are quite, uh, I think, uh, impressive in a sense that last, uh, 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 just uh, last, uh, yesterday we had in Italy alone 368 people who oh. died. And that's a real uh, impressive number, and I think we should be really worried at this point. Has there are now 67, 68 countries, at least, yeah. in which a few of these cases have emerged, and some where there have been a substantial n a number, number of cases. Is this the fastest that a virus like this, a coronavirus or other, is the fastest that it's uh, propagated? It's a very good question because we have examples uh, in history, last hundred years, for example, the influenza pandemic, and there we didn't have any airplanes in 1918, 1919, yeah, yeah. but still it made it in two or three months uh, all over the world. It's obviously a little bit faster, but it's not that much faster than what we have experienced. And it is a really very, very uh, uh, substanti substantial threat we have and that it may, we have no idea how long it will stay with us, and those are the real problems which we have to deal with. So the first case, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but the first case was December 1st, 2019. That's a number which we... Uh, as far remember, as we know. As, as we, yes. And now we're, we're in March yeah. only of 2018, and it's far outstripped any of the other... Many, many more yes. cases. But again, it's maybe twice or three times as fast. Unfortunately, we had some of these pandemic viruses in uh, before, and uh, uh, I think we have to live with uh, viruses in the future which become pandemic and replicate that fast and spread that fast. How do you compare it to the flu? The actual flu that Americans are very, very familiar with, I don't think most Americans understand the fatalities connected yeah. with the flu and how many there are. So they almost we, think of it as an yeah. extended common cold. Uh, you're absolutely right, and it is underestimated and under, I don't want to say underappreciated, because, right. <laughs> because we really, I mean, this is a terrible disease and people do die, 
and we have about between 20, 40, sometimes even more thousand uh, deaths per year. And this is something which we're really uh, trying to help uh, in the future by developing universal influenza virus vaccines. The same way we are trying to develop now vaccines against the coronavirus. How, how, and how do I know the difference between the symptoms for the flu or the symptoms for uh, COVID-19? Ain't easy, Mayor, ain't easy. Mm -hmm. The differential diagnosis saying this is flu or this is uh, coronavirus is not easy. And the only good thing is now that we are seeing a decline in influenza virus infections in the country. And so if we see something now, uh, it's more likely a coronavirus. Is that, is that because we're coming to the end of the season? Correct. Now, will that happen with COVID-19? Will we have a season for it? I remember so, with West Nile vi uh, 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 virus, uh, when we first dealt with it, I had a resources, a tremendous resources and spraying. And they told me, you, you, you got to deal with about three, four months. Then it's going to go into hiatus. Then it's going to come back next spring. And no, it's an absolutely fantastic point you brought up. We have this seasonality of influenza virus in the Northern Hemisphere, obviously, where we have uh, December, January, February, March. Then it really comes down. And it might be. It, and I really say it might be the case also for the coronavirus. But again, uh, it's apples and oranges. We have not re we have not experienced this particular coronavirus. So I I think it's a hope, but it's not uh, being certain. Now now I'm going to move on to the two other doctors. But what is the thought you would like to uh, to, to leave us with, uh, doctor? The most important thought that you know that you think we should. We hope, we hope that we, we shall survive, meaning that we uh, have a, an end to this uh, pandemic and that we will be pre pre better prepared in the future. Well, I'm sure because of people like you, we will be, because you, I found in working with the scientific community in New York, it's the best in the country. Yes. And you learn from whatever small mistakes we make. Boy, you learn very, very quickly. Dr. Polisi, thank you very, very much. Okay. A very informative good. Thank you. talk, and, and, and good luck in this very substantial challenge. I'm sure you're up to it, and we'll do a great job. And now we'll take a short break, and we'll be right back. For those of you who know me, in addition to law and politics, I'm passionate about the Yankees, baseball, football, all sports to watch, golf to play, history to read, opera, classical music to listen to, and watch and cigars to relax and socialize and i have definite opinions on the best cigars for the right time and the right place and you'll hear about that too but the revolution in cigars took place in the 1990s most cigars then were machine made with foreign ingredients now it's just the opposite most are hecho and mono, man-made. All organic, natural, and premium. The revolution was led by one man and one man alone, Marvin Schenken, and Cigar Aficionado magazine. Marvin had been rating wines quite successfully for Wine Spectator magazine, and he brought the rating system to cigars. The first cigars rated in the 90s were gone in a flash. Even now, the first thing I do when I get my magazine is I go right to the ratings page. Here it is. Hmm, 93, 91. Oh, yeah, I'll go for that one. Then there'll be 94. Whoa, 92. Problem is you got to get there fast because they go fast. This revolutionized the cigar industry. They're the magazines for you. And you know what? Subscribe to Cigar Aficionado right now to the link on our website. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Mario Garcia, who is the Chief of Cardiology, the Division of Cardiology at Montefiore Hospital, a great New York hospital. And uh, you might say, well, Chief for Cardiology, there's infectious disease, 
Why is he here? Well, for a very important reason, and he's going to be discussing the global effects of uh, something like this. A hospital is not a single entity. It's a large entity. If he gets overwhelmed in one area, we're going to have problems in another. Plus, as a doctor, he has uh, obviously uh, developed a great deal of knowledge about this. So, uh, Dr. Garcia, we're very, very pleased to have you. Can you tell us, when you have a... uh, well, now pandemic like this, which is almost like an emergency situation day in and day out in the hospital. What impact does it have on all of the other disciplines in the hospital who are equally or as important or in some situations maybe more important? Uh, Mr. Major, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, obviously, our attention right now is focused on the pandemic, which is emerging um, and expanding uh, and affecting our daily lives. Uh, but I want to remind everyone that for um, the last over 100 years, the number one cause of death uh, by far is cardiovascular disease. For men and women? For men and women. A lot of women uh, don't know that. Correct. Right. More, more than breast cancer. Um, mm. So when we treat patients uh, with cardiac disease, we we look at emergencies, which are still handling, and then we have what we call elective uh, procedures. Um, Within the elective procedures are those that can wait and those that we don't know how much can be Mm waited to be uh, uh, rendered. And one of the concerns that we have, of course, is when we have a pandemic like this that saturates our ability to provide care because all the hospital beds are occupied because all the physicians and nurses are attending uh, patients with uh, respiratory in, uh, illness. We don't have sufficient resources to actually take care of patients who have other illnesses well, that are I, I, important. Exactly how does that work? I mean, so so um, I come into the hospital, I have chest pains. You do a cardi- cardiogram or whatever else, and you determine... Well, well, let's say you determine that I have a significant blockage that makes me a candidate for either surgery or stent. Isn't that usually an analysis you go through? Yeah. So if you come to the hospital right now, brought by ambulance, or you go to the emergency room with chest pain, and we determine that it's urgent to proceed uh, with an intervention, we will do that uh, regardless of whatever pandemic is Regardless of the fact that are you on a, are you on a discipline now where you, where you cannot do elective surgery? Correct. I mean, one of the problems is that a lot of people actually have less acute uh, um, uh, illnesses. So they, they come to the office and they have some chest pain. We do some testing and we decide that there's a blockage and they need to be treated. That's considered now an elective procedure, right? Mm-hmm. It's not an urgent procedure. If our system is so saturated that we cannot take care of urgent procedures, but only those that are absolute emergencies, there is a uh, a risk that many many patients uh, may have an event uh, that is uh, potentially fatal. Uh, well, by sure. I mean, you, you think of these situations we all hear of. The patient comes into the hospital, he gets treated. Uh, for whatever reason, he goes home, and three hours later, he dies of a heart attack. Correct. Because this is not all completely known to us. We don't have all of the factors. You're making judgment decisions when you're making judgments about how much time should it take. Ideally, it would always be better to do it right away, wouldn't it? Correct. We want to treat uh, problems quickly. And that doesn't go only for heart disease. It goes for, for cancer. I mean, if you had a cancer and you do an operation to have the cancer removed, that's an elective procedure, but how long can you wait? If this pandemic potentially will last for too long, maybe the opportunity of getting cured uh, may go away. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the concerns that we have. So we want to slow down this epidemic. Um, so the measures that are being taken right now, like social isolation, is to actually reduce the expansion, the rate of uh, infection. So we have enough resources in our hospital system to be able to take care of everyone at one at a time. Um, if we let uh, this infection go very quickly, like this has has happened in Italy, um, we may not have the resources to take care of others. So uh, right now, your hospital is operating within 
its capacity of, of resources. Uh, we still have capacity, um, but obviously we are concerned. We look at other countries. We look at Italy, for example. Uh, Italy was overwhelmed. Right. Part of the reason why it was overwhelmed is because testing was not implemented quickly. So the disease spread in the community before nobody knew it. And only when people were getting very sick, getting to the hospital, is um, when they recognized that the problem was serious. So the serious cases of COVID-19 have to be taken to the hospital. Absolutely. Plus the other serious cases that are happening all over the city. I mean, I, I, I don't know if anyone really appreciates how big New York City is. Obviously, I do. I, I think I've been, I know I've been in every emergency room in every single hospital in the city when I was the mayor for my police officers, firefighters, sanitation workers, correction workers, and teachers. Uh, but it's, it's a very, very big, it's a very big, very big city, and it's very, very hard to overwhelm. That September 11 overwhelmed it. Overwhelmed the ho hospitals in the area. They had to be triaged. Um, and for several days, overwhelmed the hospitals. So no matter what, we can be overwhelmed. We could be overwhelmed. We are doing m many things from our end to try to mitigate the problem. Uh, we are uh, transitioning to provide more telemedicine. Uh, so patients that are potentially at risk by coming to the hospital or the doctor's office uh, could be attended uh, via the telephone with a, a visual interface um, and have a consultation with a physician directly from I've home. I've heard there's a lot more of that going on now. Correct. And th this is the right time to do there's that. A name, there's a name for it that escapes me. Inter something medicine... Into television medicine, I don't know. Telemedicine, <laughs> in general, correct. Telemedicine. Telemedicine, Telemedicine that's it. Yeah. So I, I um, so you're examining me, I'm on a screen, Yeah. and obviously, you know, you can tell a lot by looking at me as to how sick, sick I am or not, right? Correct, I can you make can a determination. You can see my eyes, you can see yeah. my complexion, you can see my general uh, atmosphere, how I'm, how I'm feeling. Yes, and, and it, it definitely may be safer... It will be safer for you to do that than to be rushed to an emergency room that may be occupied by uh, patients who are uh, at a high risk of passing along an infection to you. So you get to see it. You get to see it uh, on, on a television screen. Correct. Right. Correct. So you, 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 and therefore. And also, hopefully, you have all the vital information about that person. Correct. And, and, and definitely, we will find out some that will need to be attended relatively quickly, and we'll have to make an exception and, 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 and do uh, the appropriate treatment immediately for those um, by being able to provide that consultation online. But, but it's, it's important for the society to understand that these measures of isolation, of uh, avoiding um, uh, large crowd, uh, going to conge congested uh, spaces are important, are important to reduce that rate of transmission. So let's, let's get uh, briefly to What's the best advice that you can give to people to avoid this? And then I'm going to ask you when you think it goes too far. Yeah. So you keep both in mind. So, so, so right now, I think we know uh, that our uh, certain populations that are at very high risk, um, elderly uh, patients, uh, patients who have other conditions like advanced cardiac disease, advanced kidney disease, the best thing that we can do with them is not to get close to them, to be not honest to, with you. Not to get too close to them. So if they are at a, a nursing home, uh, give them a phone call. Uh, you cannot transmit the virus don't by phone. Don't go visit them is what you're, what you're don't, saying. Don't go and visit them, no. Uh, because you can uh, carry the virus and you can be healthy, potentially. Uh, but if they get uh, sick, uh, they, they, it could be fatal for is them. Is it a function of age or a function of condition? Let's say... Let's say you're 75, but you don't have any, uh, or you don't know that you have any immune, comp any serious disease, any, you're in good health. And let's suppose you're 45, but you've just had a uh, kidney replacement. Yeah, uh, yeah the, both are, would be at high uh, risk. The kidney replacement patient, because it takes medication that lower their immunity. So it, is, it isn't always age. It's, no, no. But is it, it, uh, but is it always age? Is a 75-year-old in excellent health at more risk than a 45-year-old in bad health? <laughs> uh, 
probably the 75 will be uh, in, be in better um, uh, health, uh, will be at a lower risk. Uh, but yet... At a lower rate, in other words, you have a better chance. You got a better chance to, uh, to survive. But, so, you know, I wouldn't like to expose either of them. The, uh, the idea is, right, simplified, some doctor simplified it this way. The virus attacks you. Your immune system is like an army, and it stands up to fight. But if that army has been depleted of most of its cavalry yeah. or most of its uh, infantry, they're going to lose. On yeah. the other hand, if it has a full complement of cavalry, infantry, defenses, it's going to win. Correct, correct. And, and part of the things that we want to do also uh, dealing uh, with other uh, illnesses like heart disease or cancer is to treat those conditions too because if, if you need a stent uh, you know, to treat your, your heart disease and we don't do that to you and you get infected with a virus, you're going to oh, be... Oh, of course. I never thought of the connection correct. between the two. Correct. You're well, it's gonna a be, very complicated say, time for you, doctor. Yeah. It, was really, it was really quite wonderful that you took some time out, but I do think in a situation like this, public knowledge is really critical so that we bring down bring down the hysteria. I mean, I, I'm sure you agree with me. We have to deal with this seriously, but to make people too fearful, to make them too upset, too, is, is going to just make things much worse. Uh, absolutely. Most of us uh, will definitely do okay. We will survive uh, this uh, epidemic. Uh, children do actually very well. Mm -hmm. um, younger adults, very unlikely to get sick. Um, so the majority of, of society will survive. Probably a, a, a large percentage, maybe 50% of the population eventually will get infected over the next year or the next two years. We don't know that yet, but that's what happened with other similar viral illness. But you know, to, to make that um, very gradual mm -hmm. and to protect the, the individuals in society that are at risk is what we need to do right now. And the way to cough is like this. <coughs> Correct? Correct. And, and, and then you say goodbye with the other elbow. And now I'm going to say goodbye and thank you very, very much, Dr. Garcia, which is now the second time that we've met, right? Correct. We've met under other circumstances. My pleasure, yeah. Major. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, we are now with Dr. Adam Keene, who is with Montefiore Hospital and is right in the eye of the storm. Dr. Keene. Uh, oh deals my with God. these cases day in and day out. He's an infectious disease uh, doctor, which is um, which is exactly the doctor that has to uh, deal with these viruses, and he's been doing it all throughout his career. And he'll be able to give us firsthand information about what's what's going on. So, doctor, what? Um, how did you first become aware aware of this? This is a totally different new virus. You're used to the fact, as an infectious disease doctor, that viruses change. But every time they do, that must be a bit of a surprise, right? Um, yes. I, I think I would say that, um, uh, you know, we have pandemics. If you look uh, through, through the years, uh, we seem to have, a, you know, a, a, a few a decade. Um, I've been through four or five myself. Um, so... Uh, you know, the, the last one that we faced uh, that we had a lot of concern about was Ebola, and I, mm -hmm. I helped with our response to that and preparations for that. Um, and so after that, we, we thought more about the fact that more would be coming and what to do the next time. This particular outbreak is more like what we've been expecting, which is what's called pandemic influenza, a, a large... More, more yeah. than... Uh, uh, Mir and SARS and uh, things like that? It's very similar, you know, genetically to MERS and SARS and, and clinically acts very much like it. Um, so uh, so it's, uh, it's more infectious, meaning that it infects people more, more easily than MERS and SARS did, but it's also somewhat less lethal, uh, except for in certain segments of the population. The, number, the numbers, though, are strikingly different between MERS, SAR, on the one hand, even though they're coronaviruses, and um, COVID-19. I mean, there you had 1,000 cases or so. The deaths were, were minuscule compared to the deaths. You already got eight, ten times the number of deaths. 
They were in a few countries. This is already in 67 countries. Right. So what's the big difference between them? Did, uh, you, did you stop that one faster? Or is this more prolific virus? Does this have the capacity to be a more prolific virus? It's both. I think uh, we stopped both MERS and SARS more rapidly. Um, uh, both because they were somewhat less infectious and because of our response to them. Um, so, you know, the initial phases of any epidemic or attempts at containment, um, both MERS and SARS were contained. Um, coronavirus, COVID-19 virus specifically, uh, were past a containment phase. When, or, did, that, when did that happen? Uh, I can't give you an exact date, but I would say that we've been transitioning uh, in, our, in sort of our approach to this over the past month or so, realizing that we're more in a mitigation phase, a phase where we're trying to, what we say, flatten the curve of the outbreak. In other words, uh, the Department of Health, and as Dr. Anthony Fauci said, um, you know, we, it, we can expect that a large percent of the population will be infected with this virus at some point in the next few years. Um, and where did, and where did uh, so, so it started in Japan, and uh, I'm sorry, in China. in China, and by the time it got out of China, it was oh, it a full-blown full blown virus and a, 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 on its way to becoming a pandemic. It seemed like there were an awful lot of cases there right away, yeah. and still half the deaths and half the cases, even though it's declining in China, are in China. Right. Yeah, so China had a extremely large outbreak uh, that there's... Much larger than I think we've ever seen any place, of, any place before. Yes, and, um, you know, it was late to be recognized and late to be controlled, but when they controlled it, they used very draconian measures. What are they doing? And, uh, very extreme forms of social isolation, um, not allowing, uh, you know, movement... Um, shutting down businesses to only the essentials, uh, forbidding any forms of public gathering, things like that, things that go beyond what I imagine would be tolerable in the United States, to be honest. Now, the spread of the United States doesn't seem to be, well, maybe I'm wrong, you tell me. The, the spread of the United States, is it fat? would you consider it fast? Um, the number of deaths is around 60, 70 deaths. Number of cases about six thousand or so. I'm not sure of the exact number. In a country of 274, 274 million people, it doesn't sound like a right. Right now, it doesn't sound like it. Is, is the fear, the prediction of how fast it moved in China, Italy, and um, and South Korea? You know, I think the concern is that we may be like Italy was two or three weeks ago, where um, there's a lot, it's clear that there's community spread now, um, and there's a lot more disease out there than we know, and the reason that we, we don't know how much disease is out there is because we have not been able to test right. uh, adequately. So it takes time from when you get infected to when you show any symptoms, and from when you get any symptoms to when you get ill and enough to be hospitalized. We're just starting in New York, at least, to see those patients who are ill enough to be hospitalized. How many, how many patients have you seen? So uh, currently at, at my hospital system, uh, we have 23 cases, um, eight of which are in the, uh, in the intensive care unit. Um, that is from, you know, three days ago we had two. Um, as you know, there was a large outbreak in, in New Rochelle, and we service that area. Oh, you do? Yes. Oh, you so, service New Rochelle? Yes. Any other hospitals share it with you? Well, there's a there's a uh, an affiliate, there's a branch of Montefiore that's in New Rochelle, oh, actually. Yes, 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 um, yes. But we take, uh, it, we're a referral hospital, the hospital <laughs> so that how I bad, work how, ba how bad is New Rochelle? I know, uh, I know it's been a um, pretty extreme measures. It's been, I, I, yes. it's like an isolated area. You can't go in you can't go out right. so it's been a, a large outbreak i think they've been taking very uh, appropriate extensive measures in terms of testing and isolating uh and limiting public gatherings um in terms of uh the actual number of patients that will be very sick out of that specific outbreak i think we're just starting to see 
the beginnings of it. As I say, that the number of patients in our hospital in the last two days has gone up fourfold. So uh, by next week, we'll know a lot better. How, how far? How far can we go in deal in dealing with this? Uh, we now have we've now have canceled the schools. We've canceled all forms of entertainment. We've canceled restaurants. I'm sure I missed some things we canceled. It seemed to me the city was empty today. Right. Churches churches are even canceling religious services, which I've never heard happen. Is it really that? Is it that necessary? Um, I think it's it's. Uh I think it's uh, the right thing to do because uh, what we're trying to do right now, which Dr. Garcia referred to as well, is what we call flattening the curve, where we, we slow the spread of this disease. We realize it's going to spread, uh, that it's going to be part of our, of our population, and that a large percentage of patients are going to be infected with it. But what we want to make sure is that that spread is as slow as possible so that our healthcare systems aren't hit by critically ill patients all at once and so that our healthcare systems aren't overwhelmed. So that we're able to provide care, we have adequate resources to provide care, uh, really life-saving treatments for patients who can be saved. So what do you need? I'm sure you need, uh, I'm sure you need things that you don't have that I remember I remember in uh, anthrax, uh, we needed more tests. They were getting backed up by two and three weeks, which left people in a horrible state of not knowing whether they should be treated for anthrax or not. Um, and therefore, we went ahead and treated them. Right. So what, what, what uh, right. if you could pick your wish list of one, two, or three things that right away... Yeah, it'd have to be at least three for me. So uh, <laughs> tests, uh, you know, not only numbers, but uh, distribution and availability of tests... You know, if we can't get a test done and can't get it uh, a result quickly, uh, if a patient is, is, has right, symptoms sure, sure. of Boom. this disease, we have to treat them as though they have it. And that takes a lot of resources. Yeah. That takes uh, very precious resources in hospitals like negative pressure isolation rooms, a lot of personal protective equipment, a lot of precautions that we have to take. And we don't have endless resources. Uh, so that would be number two, would be these resources, um, physical resources. So uh, what we call respirator masks, which are a special kind of mask um, for healthcare personnel to use. Why, why do they need that? Uh, it prevents uh, them from becoming infected when they're caring for a patient, particularly when a patient's undergoing uh, uh, procedures mm -hmm. that, that critically ill patients undergo. I, I I am an infectious disease doctor, but my primary practice is in critical care. And in critical care, we do a lot of procedures to keep patients alive, like putting them on breathing right. machines that generate aerosol and generate, um, and that makes, uh, sets up an infectious situation where the environment becomes highly infectious. So these, these are the things that you think you, that, that you would need immediately. Right. To, so, to move to move things along. So so more 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 respirators. More respirators. Yes, um, so that we can safely care for patients. Right. Um, so that particularly our nurses don't get sick quickly. The nurses we always talk about doctors, but the nurses are actually at the bedside yeah. the most, providing the most care. Um, the you know, and so they're the most at risk. Well, so we can't lose. Uh, um, we can deal with with sickness. We can deal with. Uh, people going on furlough, but it can't happen all at once. Otherwise, we just won't be able to provide the care. Well, I hope you don't go on furlough, doctor. We're going to need you for another couple of weeks. How much longer? Uh, it's hard to say. We, I, I, we, you know, this, a, this is a this is a new uh, it's a new virus. Um, coronaviruses tend to be seasonal, but the seasonal variation has varied by virus. Right. So we can all hope that this will go away. Uh, when it gets warmer, when the summer comes, but we right. just don't know that yet. And the summer meaning June, July? Hopefully, as the weather warms, but again, we don't know that. Well, let's hope. Doctor, thank you very, very much for coming here and also mostly for your contribution to helping the people of the city. I know uh, Montefiore Hospital very, very well. I know what a fine hospital is. 
And I know your staff is working way beyond the call of duty. So would you please give them all personally my my admiration? I will, and I think they'll be uh, very grateful for that. Well, thank Mr. you, Mayor. Doctor. Thank you. So that uh, will conclude our episode tonight on, on this, or today, whichever uh, you elect to, to watch it. Uh, I hope it gave you information that will be helpful to you. And, of course, we'll be following up on this. This is by no means at an end. Let's hope it starts to see some control over it, or even more control. But uh, for now, this is Rudy Giuliani with Common Sense, and we'll be back you know, very shortly.